Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I told you this film was going to be wank. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Hellraiser Judgment. It came out in 2018. Written and directed by Gary J. Tunicliffe. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for Hellraiser Judgment? Well, the story follows Pinhead. An aging priest from hell who's realised that his fucking film career has died. He decides to leave hell and buy a house with his gay bum chum, the fucking auditor. And they decide that they're just going to send letters out to people so that they can punish them for their sins or whatnot. At the same time, we follow two cops who are supposed to be brothers as well, but I really don't give a shit, who are searching for some fucking killer called the Perceptor. How this all intertwines with Hellraiser, I don't fucking know, but they're going to end up meeting at some point, and it's going to be really shit. Go on. Go on. Well, Gary J. Tunicliffe was the makeup artist on Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, mm. and will continue to be the makeup designer for Doug Bradley as Pinhead for the remainder of the Hellraiser franchise, all the way up until... Hellraiser Revelations, where famously Doug Bradley went, I'm done playing Pinhead in shitty Miramax films. He had a problem with Miramax bastardizing Clive Barker's work, essentially with these cash-in sequels. And as we know, Doug Bradley was best friends with Clive Barker way before Hellraiser was even a thing. So you can understand Doug kind of going, look, I've done, I've, I've, I've besmirched Clive Barker in his name long enough. Yeah. You know, I've been the icon of horror. The The script is terrible. Your payment offer is terrible. I'm done. Plus, you know, this is a script that wasn't Hellraiser. Yeah. You made it a Hellraiser film, so I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. Miramax went, okay, so we'll try and get Clive Barker back and we'll try and get Doug Bradley back and we'll reboot Hellraiser. It's been 10 years this conversation's been going on for mm -hmm. and it's still nowhere closer to being done. And as we know, Miramax are very possessive with the rights to the Hellraiser franchise. They don't want to give it up. And the time limit was coming where they had to either make a film or give the rights back to Clive Barker. What do you think they did, Ian? They fucking paid for Harvey Weinstein's defense case. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they went to Gary and said, look, you know, you said you had a script for a Hellraiser 10. What is it? And so he gave them judgment and they went, no, we're not making that. That's that's awful. That's no one's going to make that. And so he left and he went to all of these different studios and he took the Hellraiser off it and went, here's my film called Judgment. And every other studio went, nope, nope. 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 And he was like, okay. And then Miramax phoned him up and went, he got that script, uh, Hellraiser Judgment. Rights are going back next week. Make the film. <laughs> and he was given a budget of $350,000, which is, which is nothing. Yeah, that's like that, a fucking directed payment. That, that is really nothing. I mean, the first Hellraiser film had a budget of $1 million, but that was in the late 80s. But, the studio did say, how about you get Doug back? And Gary was like, I need Doug, Doug Bradley back. I cannot make this film without him. He is our pinhead. And so we tried to get Doug Bradley back. And Doug was like, I'm not even going to read your script. And this is where there's kind of been a bit of drama behind the scenes with Doug and with Gary, who obviously were friends since Hellraiser 3. Yeah. And now they don't even talk to each other anymore. So it, I'm kind of sad that their friendship ended, really. And I'm kind of... I kind of feel sorry for Gary. Because he loves Hellraiser. He is a huge fan of Hellraiser. Been there since the third film. Loves working on the franchise. Has all these ideas for it. But he's not Clive Barker. No. So he has his own zany ideas as to what to do with the material. But I'm thankful that at least he was given a chance to to write it, direct it, do the special effects for it, and make something of his own, despite the fact that nobody, nobody really gives a shit. Because when you get to Hellraiser 10, after you've been through the last six films to get to this one, you know, it's only your die-hard horror fans 
and and you who who will watch every sequel to every franchise that was established in the eighties, and we'll keep doing so. No, 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 we fucking won't. No, 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 no. If they bring if, out, you're drawing a line mate, in the sand. I don't, man, if they fucking bring out a Hellraiser fucking eleven, it, I. If it's done by fucking Miramax again, if it's directed by the fucking same director of this one as Revelations, you can go fuck yourself. I, 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 no, carry on. <laughs> and so he tried to get Doug Bradley back and he tried to get him to sign in a non-disclosure agreement. Doug Bradley just went, no, I'm never going to sign that to read your damn script. And all of these things occurred. And so Doug Bradley is kind of... I think he's now just waiting for a phone call from Clive Barker saying, the reboot's happening, come back, hell needs you. So we now get a new actor playing Pinhead in this film. And, yeah. So then those are the souls we shall seek out first. I, I don't want to say anything, honestly. You know, I was raised with the, if you haven't got anything fucking good to say, don't fucking say anything at all. So... I fucking don't want to say anything because this film is fucking shit. But I feel like I have to because y- you're you're partially defending this movie. I'm just explaining how it came to be. Yeah. It's fuck. They should have just fucking sold the rights. You should have just sold the rights back to Clive Barker. You know, at, at least at least. You know, you could have made a kind of friendship where the two of you could have fucking stuck a name on it. Maybe distributed distributed by Miramax, maybe? Owned by Clyde Park? No. 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 We've got Pinhead talking to the auditor at the beginning, played by the director, discussing how the Lament configuration box just isn't doing its job anymore. We're in the 21st century. Sinners are fucking getting away with so much shit. Nobody wants to fucking open a box anymore. They need a lament configuration app. Well, you can open the box on your phone. Man, fucking Hell World had a fucking video <laughs> game. Oh, yeah. They could have fucking set up through Facebook. <laughs> but no. Let's buy a house. <laughs> the address is 55 something house it's the house from the first hellraiser film it's not actually the fucking house from well the they tried to make I was it look say. partially like it but that's the address of the original hellraiser house so it just made me laugh that pinhead's just hanging out in kirsty and frank's old house I just, oh man why would you say that? <laughs> that's what he's fucking doing oh god they invite some fucking pedophile to the fucking house you know because the auditor just writes letters out to people. Well, he's trying to bait people to, to come to the house. Dude, we literally just had a conversation about it being the fucking 21st century. Who writes letters? Serial killers. <laughs> and so when you get a letter through your door telling you that you're, you've got a friend somewhere and you need to come to this address alone, you go, oh yeah, well then. I fucking kill children. I bet you this is a nice little holiday home I can go to. Well, it's like Pinhead says later, evil seeks evil. Does he say anything in this movie? I must have phased out. Sorry. (laughs) So, at this introduction is, you know, I like some of the props. I like the set. I just think that the lighting and the camera work just doesn't match. Uh, I can see your expertise in making sets, making graphic uh, outfits, the Cenobites, you know, you've you've perfected that. But when you light it, like the way you have, it loses its impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're in a house, dude. They they are in a house. This isn't the seventh level of hell. They're, They're in a house. They must have a kitchen somewhere in a front room where they all sit down together at night talking about what they're going to fucking do the next day. <clears throat> so, this serial killer, they've got him in this chair and they start questioning him about all of his sins and he starts recounting about some of the horrible deeds he's done. But should he resist, the auditor threatens more violence upon him. And so the answers are more f- forthcoming. Once the auditor's done, he leaves the room and the assessor comes into the room with his little briefcase. And a vial of children's tears, which he uses to put on the the sheets of sins, before he consumes them. And then vomits them back out into a funnel, which is fed into another room, 
where there are three mostly naked Cenobites that are called the Jury. And they stick their hands in the vomited sin paper and then consume it. Ladies, your verdict. And the verdict is always the same. It's fucking... So then he's to be taken to the cleaners. And he's strapped to a table. And three old ladies kind of lick him all over. Really? I didn't see any of that. Half of this shit you're describing happens off screen. And so once he's done with the cleaners, it's time to meet the butcher. And we get this great big hulking behemoth walk in with the baby face on. And you can hear the sound effects of a baby screaming. And then emerges from the butcher, the gas mask thing. Uh, it, it was the gimp from Pulp Fiction. What, and he's got two gimp? twin blades and he cuts the guy to pieces. I was Did like... That's not really very Hellraiser-ish, but I'll go with it. Uh, you Really? Most of this shit happens off screen. We see fuck all. <laughs> the fact as well that this... This all happens before the fucking credits comes up. We're talking a fucking 10 minute fucking sequence of over intense, over the top noise and imagery trying to force you into a position like you're watching a Saw movie crossed with Hostel, crossed with Hellraiser. Done. Badly. I... I've, I sat there through that whole fucking... Fu Fucking first 10 minutes. You know, fucking Andy. Andy, I'll fucking have you after this. Andy says, oh yeah, it's fucking intense. Oh yeah. The only intense bit was that fat man eating shoveling paper into his mouth. You know, yeah, that was fucking intense. Because if I ever want to watch a fat man fucking eat paper, I'll fucking do it my fucking self. Trivia time. That was John Gulliger, the director of the three Feast movies. Playing the assessor. I mean, Feast 1's alright. Yeah. But that's it. And he, yeah, he eats the paper and then vomits it all back up. I, oh, fuck off. And then, just to make sure you, you realise you're watching a Hellraiser movie, we see Pinhead in a chair. Leaning back. I, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell honestly if he was revelling in the screams of the damned or he was thinking about how his life had turned so shit that this was where he was now. Then we get the credits. <laughs> Made me think of Seven. <laughs> it's Which... funny you should mention that because Gary J. Tunicliffe was, when he was trying to pitch the film to studios, he realised that you have to have a high concept. Yeah. You can't go on oh, making a Saw meets Hellraiser film. So we went, I'm making a Seven meets Hellraiser film. Oh, great. Because studio executives love that. Yeah. Especially, and... at, especially at this time when, obviously, Kevin Spacey... Has just come off the back of, you know, his shit. Well, it was the fact that the studios kind of, for whatever reason, they love detective movies. And it's probably the reason why there have been so many detective stories in the Hellraiser franchise. So let's have another one. Yeah. It makes the studio bosses happy. I, I didn't even... I wrote their names down, but I don't even... I don't even think I know them well enough to call them by their actor's name. We got good cop, bad cop and girl cop. It was Sean and David Carter, the brothers, and I think she was Edgerton, yeah. Detective Edgerton, but who wasn't actually in the original script. The studio executives were like, no, we need a female actress character in here too. Yeah, because we need something to balance out these brothers, because the whole brother aspect of this film is so fucking wank. You know, do we even care that they're brothers? Do we even know any of the backstory? I mean, is the good cop looking up to his... His brother and wants to follow in his footsteps, or does he just see the bad cop as just a fucking waste of space? But the whole time they're chasing some fucking killer known as the Perceptor. I mean, I've heard some shitty fucking horror character names in my time, but the Perceptor? You why didn't you just call him the Fisherman and brought back? F oh man, I would have watched fucking I know what you did last summer of this movie. Ouch. Yeah. But we see some fucking blonde girl go into her home. 
And all these candles are set up. You know, just in case you forgot it was a Hellraiser movie, we need the candles in it. And she's like, Josh, Josh, is that you? Have you come over? I don't want to sleep with you anymore, Josh. You're using me like a piece of shit. Oh, actually, maybe I'll have one fucking fuck turn with you before you go because, well, you know. <sighs> Tease the audience that we might get some fucking titties in this film. Oh, yeah, the, well, we already had titties, didn't we? And we had the fucking blood tits, didn't we, where they got splashed all over. Yeah, that was enjoyable. But then this masked person, I'm going to say man, because it's a man, comes out of nowhere and fucking punches her in the face and knocks her out onto the floor and fucking, that's it. She's killed off screen. Again. And then the two cops turn up and we see the horrific mess that the preceptor has left her in. Oh wait, she's just crucified on the floor. She's not even crucified. She's just lying there with her arms out. This film is so low budget. Any description I give to you without any footage makes the film sound fucking awesome. So, uh, I'm, I'm, no. You can tell it's a low budget because it's just the three of them there and, and the victim. And I'm like, where's the photographer, the coroner, the, the chief of police, you know, the detective agencies? A anything else. Anything else. <laughs> it's like, no. But then we get the horror moment. Where it looks like there's something moving inside of her. And they remove the dog. Which is pretty graphic. But yeah, they remove the dog from her belly. And you're supposed to now assume that the preceptor has gone around and done this like, I don't know, a bunch of fucking times. And done some really horrific things to people that we never see. Well, there are occasional flashes to someone with a hacksaw. Oh, uh, fuck off. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> fuck off. Fuck off. You know, I didn't want him. You fucking, you can't push me. Fuck you. Fuck you. There was a fucking, one fucking cut sequence where they just fucking cut to night time. And we see the saw blade. And we don't know what's going on. We don't know what the fuck it's doing. It's just there. It doesn't explain anything. But the next day, the cops have been called to a fucking kiddies park. And the killer has cut off a bunch of thieves' hands at the wrist and it has left them gripping eyeballs and teeth. Because that's part of the commandments. Thou shall not steal. But if you do, I'll cut off your fucking hands and arrange it into this fucking little circle. Oh, fuck off. Fuck off. Eye for an eye. Fuck this film. Two for a two. Fuck off. Fuck you! I told you what happened if you fucking defended this film! You know what this film needs, Ian? The fucking lobotomy! A montage! Oh. Let's do this. Who the fuck puts a montage 23 minutes into a movie? Now, I... I had to watch this film a second time. You fucking dickhead. Because after watching it the first time, whenever the cops were doing cop stuff, my attention level just... It reached beyond the bottom of the barrel to the point where I was on my phone looking at Twitters. And I was like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm watching Hellraiser. What am I doing? Oh, yeah, it was boring. Yeah. Does that mean anything to you? No, why should it? Carl Watkins. Who? It's the cardinal sin. Like, don't be boring. At least, like, the first 15 minutes wasn't boring. At least you could, you know, you could hate on it. Yeah, or you could get it, upset yeah. with it. Yeah. But then, you know, but at least it had some... It was interesting and it was bizarre. Yeah. You didn't know what was going on. And trying to connect it to Hellraiser and figure out what the lore was. Yeah. When you have a couple of cops... Just three... Three cops three. talking about a crime. It's just, it's flat. Mm. It is dull. And to make it worse, they montage. Yeah. Watching them moving around the office. 
tr pretending to solve this case. And that was just like, no. But the thing is, talking about the, the, the transitions between scenes, yeah. this film has some of the worst transitions because it reuses the same transition of Pinhead leaning back in his chair. Mm -hmm. We have transitions of the hacksaw cutting away at whatever. Yeah. We have transitions, and I know that, that it's stock footage that they paid for off a website of just the city. Yeah. yeah. Sped up. Yeah. And I was like, these transitions are awful. Yeah. Like, it's just, no. I mean, no. And so you can understand that the interest in the actual story outside of Pinhead and Hell is just, 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 it's probably the worst. You know, Revelations at least. It it didn't get boring. No, no. It got stupid. Yeah, but it wasn't boring. This one got boring. This is this one's worse than Deader, and Deader was fucking shit. I mean, I I just started thinking about other films I'd rather be watching. You know, I went through the Hellraiser series. I was like, you know what? I'd watch any of the other Hellraisers other than this one. I'd watch Hellworld again just for fucking Lance Henriksen. Just because it's more interesting than this. I even got to the point I wanted to turn this film off and watch Alien vs. Predator Requiem. That's how fucking bad this film was. You know, I kept saying to myself, maybe it's not as bad as Tekken 2. Maybe it's not as bad as Tekken 2. Three quarters of the way through this film, I really wanted to see fucking... Taka Mishinoku from fucking Tekken turn up and do his teleport sequence. The fucking... Oh, oh, God. Fucking Carter, bad cop, bad cop, right? He's going through some shit in his life at the moment. We don't know what, we don't get told. He goes home at one point and sees his wife. His wife looks like an alcoholic. What's pushed her over the edge? I don't know, I don't honestly fucking care, okay? But somehow he gets he gets the invite to, to the Hellraiser house. I mean, did he get a letter? Did he get a phone call? I must have phased out, I, I don't know. But he, he goes there and they fucking... They fucking faded him, just getting out of the fucking car. He pulls up in the car, all of a sudden he's outside. I was like, wow, this man can teleport. He teleports to the other side of the car. I'm like, that's pretty fucking impressive. And then he teleports away to the fucking door. And it's just that they edited him. Would getting you rather watch him do the whole routine of walking up to the door? <laughs> man, but like you said, this film was so fucking boring. I was picking at anything and everything going on because nothing was fucking going on. So just watching some shitty editing of him getting out of the car got my interest. There's a point. There was a point at the beginning when the jury, right, they go into the room, they put their fucking hands in that vomit. As it fades, it fades into the scene of the three girls come in and I shit you not, when the last girl in the line gets down, she has to shuffle her leg to get in position. That took me right out of the fucking film. Right at the start, because I spotted that. Because if you're a fucking jury member from the seventh level of hell, you shouldn't be fucking shifting. But you're not. You're a female actress in some shitty fucking Hellraiser movie where the fucking director didn't have the time, the patience, or the money to go back and reshoot that fucking scene again. He just looked at it and went, Oh, maybe nobody noticed. I fucking noticed! So this is my favourite scene in the film. Oh, fuck you. Now, that's because things got interesting again. And these were probably the best actors in the film. The Auditor and Sean Carter, the bad cop. Right. <laughs> and it's because it's set up because of, the, because of the introduction where we had, you know, this slobbly man panicking, going, ah, what the fuck is going on? Ah, help me. And then we have this cop who's just like, I don't give a fuck, just get this done with so I can get out of here. Yeah. And the Auditor's just like, oh. Do you oh. think that was the last day of filming? I think you've earned yourself a reward. Answer, ask me your questions and I'll answer you. And he's like, what the fuck are those things over there? Oh, those are the lament configurations. Eh. We just got them on show. You collecting know? dust. Because no one dust. opens them anymore. Yeah. And uh, so he kind of explains a few things. And then he's like, okay, right now it's time to, to get the sins out of you. And I thought that... His performance was 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 on point. He it was serviceable. It was actually okay. I was interested in finding out about this character because we've learned nothing up until this point. So I was like, okay, I get where this character is coming from now. Oh, really? And and the auditor, you know, I I find him interesting because since Hellraiser one, this is the first speaking Cenobite 
Is he even a Cenobite? I don't know. No, he's a shitty character that was written for one script, and then somebody went, this isn't going to work, so he slapped Hellraiser in it. Well, no, he, he wrote it as Hellraiser. It was always meant to be Hellraiser. This is the first Hellraiser script since the fourth one. Ah, fuck you, mate. We're in a tight fucking film in. They could have fucking dropped the Auditor, the fucking Stygian Inquisition, the Jury, the fucking Fat Bloke, the Gimp. They could have chucked out all that in the fucking Hellraiser 6. But they didn't. They only brought it in at number 10. And this is your saving fucking grace for this movie as a new fucking character? They had fucking ninjas in fucking ep- uh, fucking film eight. Cowboy fucking ninjas. Yeah, yeah, you make that fucking face. I will bring up all the fucking shit we've gone through to fucking rape on this fucking movie. Fucking sitting there, fucking bad cop. Oh, I went to the army. I shot some bad people. I shot some children. Oh, my life's so fucking shit. Well, fucking kill yourself. Why did you become a cop then? Oh, we don't know. Well, fuck you. So, after the interrogation, it's time for the assessor to return and eat the sins. Although, something's not quite right here, and he ends up violent, violently vomiting up everything. And we watch him vomit through the tube, and we see the girls all get splashed with the blood, and we can tell that something's not quite right. Yeah, because the fucking auditor is walking around with his fucking face, checking in on the rooms. Ooh, what's going on here? Ooh, what's going on here? Ooh, I think something bad's going on here. It's a fu- is, the, is it an actual house or is it a seventh level of hell? Because I wanted some fucking mysticism. Like, like, the, like the rooms were all over the place. No, it's actually like they're all on the same fucking floor. Ooh, I just look in here. Ooh, I just look in there. It would have been awesome if they could have replicated the set from Hellbound. But, yeah. Yeah. No. The, the only difference we've got here is that when we see the fucking auditor and all of his fucking cronies, it's piss yellow. And when we see fucking Pinhead sat on a chair, it's fucking nipple blue. Fucking shit. And so after, after this has happened, the auditor is just like, well, what's going on? What's happening? And uh, the doorbell goes. Yeah, there's an angel at the door. I hate this place. The stench, the decor, the seedy games and indulgences. We allow you to play as part of the arrangement. Why are you here? Let him go. He's no business here. I don't understand. Well, just because it falls into your web does not make it pray for a spider. Catch and release, do you understand? Which Hellraiser movie did you have a go at me that there was no biblical connections in the Hellraiser series? Which one was it? Which one did you tell me I was completely wrong that the levels of hell and the fucking Cenobites are no way connected to, connected to religion? Which one was that? All of them. Right. Thank you very much, fucking director of fucking number 10, bringing in God and the angel, making us have these biblical fucking connections. You let him go, do you understand? Not really, no. Well, do you understand? Gave everybody else the chance to fucking catch up. But yeah, so the angel comes along and goes, you need to let him go because, well, we're not going to tell you now. It's spoilers. So they let Cara go. And Pinhead's all fucking pissed off. Whoa, what's she going to fucking do? Come down telling me my fucking job. What the fuck is this? It's management, mate. Management will come down. Shit rolls downhill, Pinhead. And you are really, really far at the bottom. I mean, the fucking auditor has a higher rank than you because she spoke to him first. Not you. The auditor mentions it to you. And what does Pinhead say in all his fucking glory? Oh, well, he'll be back. They always come back. They always come back. So, after the interesting stuff... We're back to the boring stuff. And it is pretty dull. We watch we watch Sean wander around, he goes back home to his wife, and he has nightmares about the twin female Cenobites. He he Fine. wakes up from a nightmare all aroused and has sex with his wife. But uh. then he keeps flashing to the Cenobites, so he's like, ah, and he wanders out and gets drunk. You know, the, the, the thing was, right, they put a lot of, they, like I said, they put a bit of effort 
effort, a little bit of effort into Pinhead and the fucking auditor. But every other Pinhead just looked like a cosplay outfit. I don't know if it was the fact, if, if it was just the lighting just made it look a lot more rubbery than what it normally is. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, I liked... Especially the, the twins. The, I liked the whiteness of of original Pinhead. Yeah. This one was like a chrome kind of colour, like yeah. a silvery colour. Yeah. The pins also didn't look quite right. And, you know, he, he carried himself slightly like Pinhead, but he didn't have any of the charisma or the charm that Doug brought to the role that made it what it is. Yeah. And so, even though they manipulated his voice... There was only one line of dialogue that the actor as Pinhead delivered that made me that made it sound like Pinhead, mm. and it was him just saying no. 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 But every other line that he says, it was just like that. That filter that you're using is too much, and it's the same for the auditor I found as well. I couldn't mm. tell if the auditor's lip sync was off at some points. Um, maybe. His answers choked the assessor. First the jury and some to feel innocence. Where is he now? I sent him to be cleaned. You know what? I, I can't even fucking be bothered to fucking hold it in. Spoilers. Bad cop's the fucking killer. He, he's the killer. Because he yeah. ends up... Him and, him and the female cop go to the coroner. And we know he's the coroner because he's wearing one of these really Hawaiian colourful shirts. I swear I've seen that somewhere in another fucking horror movie where the coroner was wearing a colourful shirt. It's probably a fucking Hellraiser movie. But the fucking, the, the coroner goes, oh yeah, we found her smartphone. And, um, oh, uh, the battery just happened to die at the last location that she was at. So we still got the location. I didn't know phones could do that. That's amazing, you know. Um, and so they follow the, the address to a fucking warehouse and they get there and they realize that this is the home base of the preceptor and bad cop and edger turn are walking around going oh oh look at all these photos look at these pictures of the people that he's killed look at this last one and he pulls the curtain down and it's bad cop's wife and his brother in a really shit mobile phone picture after they've just had sex who took that fucking picture. I just completely realised something. What? We didn't even talk about the special guest in this fucking movie. Go on. Go on. Do it. No way. You have to. I'm fucking sat here talking about this film. You've got to fucking do it. Heather Lengenkamp was like, you know, a scream queen. You know, she was the one who defeated Freddy Krueger. Like, three times! You know, she died one of the times. Yeah, but, but she still fucking whooped his ass. Yeah. And so, you know, th the reason we all knew that Hellraiser 10 was in production was because Heather Lenkenkamp leaked out that she was she was acting in it. She was going to be in the next Hellraiser film. And a lot of us Hellraiser fans were like, Ooh, they've actually got a recognisable name coming, coming to the Hellraiser franchise. Someone from the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise is coming over to Hellraiser. That's awesome! He's not in. That cocksucker owes me two months' rent. He hasn't been here for a couple of days. Think you'd be hiding out inside? If he is, he's freezing his ass off in the dark. A landlady. She doesn't even have a name. She is landlady. And the camera work and the, the lighting is so fucking terrible that I honestly, ten minutes after seeing that sequence, had to stop it and rewind it just to make sure that it was actually her. Why did they cast her? Why did she agree to do this? Because she, because she thought she was signing up for a Hellraiser movie and then she walked in on set and the guy went, we can't pay you and we can't do anything with your makeup. We literally just need you to walk down these stairs, give a bit of info to our three cops and they're going to walk into a different set. Thank you. Bye. That's so sad. But anyway, getting back towards the rest of the fucking shitty film, fucking Edgerton has just realised that Bad Cop's the preceptor, and he beats her up. You know, he's got every chance. He's, this guy's supposed to be a fucking 
fucking John Doe, fucking mad serial killer, fucking psychopath. And all I actually see him do in this film is punch people in the mouth. Somehow he um, lures his brother to the fucking place as well. Oh, no, actually, change that. He convinces his brother to come to the fucking house with him. And uh, when they get there, the brother is obviously given the uh, Laman configuration box and him and his wife, the well, bad cop's wife, have to fucking undo it, don't they? Yeah, yeah. You see his wife come in and he points the gun and he tells her to go over to be next to his brother. She's like, what's going on? <sighs> And then they see the picture of them on the wall that they that they didn't realise somebody had taken. And so, yeah, you know, and within seconds they open the box. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's super easy to open the box. Oh, my God. This is cool. The box wants to be opened. And so, you know. Shittest transition. Pinhead. You know, it's a cool shot watching Pinhead walk in. You know, that, that was the trailer shot. I was like, that, that looked cool. Mm. It's a visual, like three second visual. And then, of course, he opens his mouth and starts speaking. And it's... I was captivated by it again because I was interested again in just seeing how this played out. It doesn't play out particularly well. Oh, uh, but, you know, pin, Pinhead's just like, you know what, your, your brother and your wife, you know, we'll just dispose of them real quick because they're inconsequential to anything. Oh, it was so wank. So bad, we get a single chain. Bad Cop tries to fucking convince... The auditor and the fucking and Pinhead to take them instead of him. It's like, we'll make a deal, right? No, I'm sorry, sir. That's not how this works. We're just going to take them anyway because you brought them to us. And the fucking and bad cops just left there all in his own, ready to be fucked up. But hey ho, the angel fucking wasser face is fucking turned up again. No, Pinhead, you can't do this. It's against God's will. He's doing his. He's killing these people so that he can put the fear of God in them and that they'll be more religious. Bloody blood, blood. Oh, it's so wank. And you know, Pinhead being put in his place by an angel. Is uh, he's not amused, and so he decides to string the angel up with his chains. I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that's you wouldn't what you'd imagine Pinhead to do. You know, he doesn't like to take shit from anyone, especially from those upstairs. Oh god! And uh, she's like, look, you know, you you you'll release me, or I will inflict upon you such terrible suffering. And that just makes Pinhead, you know, kind of laugh a little bit. He's just like, I am pain personified. What could you possibly do to me? Doesn't she fucking say Jesus wept as well? Yeah. Here endeth the lesson. Jesus. And so after Pinhead has ripped this angel a new asshole, which isn't very fucking good anyway, fucking Bad Cop ends up going back to the real world and gets shot by Edgerton. So the so, Perceptor's dead. And Hell doesn't get to claim him. Yeah. But yeah. Heaven does. And, and they judge him and was going to send him to Hell, but not Pinhead's Hell, but Biblical Hell? Or... or ah? Yeah, don't, 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 honestly, just don't, mate. Just don't. It w won't work. Uh, because after, obviously, fucking, fucking, fucking bad cops being killed and the angels being ripped apart, God's not too happy about it. So he gets Pinhead to walk into a really, really bright lit room. And... Strips him of his immortality, his pinnedness, his cenobitiveness, or whatever it is. I don't fucking know. Because it cuts to a really shit alleyway with the fucking actor playing Pinhead out of makeup, sitting on the floor, crying because he's suffering now because he's fucking mortal. And the worst fucking camera drone operated sequence of a cityscape follows us up. And the film ends. Did I miss anything? I mean, I... 
Pinhead's human again. Again. Sequel? I'll fucking smack you. <laughs> so, favourite scenes in Hellraiser Judgment? I, I'll go first. Okay. I'll go first. Um, my first favourite scene was Pinhead sat in a chair. Uh, my second favourite scene was the naked gun sequence at the police station where a good cop is talking to girl cop, explaining about what the preceptor has done and how he killed a, a, a mum and dad lawyers. He killed a mum and dad who were also lawyers, cut out their tongues um, and fed their tongues to their son. I mean, I made it sound really fucking awesome there. Um, hearing it from that guy with no footage, no imagery, no background for it. It's like listening to Frank Drebin explain to you a fucking police case that he's doing. You know, when he's driving in the car, you know, kind of like that, kind of like that. Um, the previous commandment prior to the landing was, thou shalt not lie. This is the Kaplan family, Jessica and Stephen, both lawyers. The preceptor cut out both of their tongues with an electric turkey knife. Let them bleed out in front of their only son, Michael. What do you do with the tongues? Put them in a blender, force fed them to the sun, lace of bleach, of course. My third favorite sequence was when he was teleporting out of the car towards the house. I, I was really amazed that he could do that. Like I said, made me think of Tekken 2. I wanted to watch Tekken 2. Honestly, I have seen hell, okay? And I really don't want it to get worse. can always get worse. It can. Yeah, it can get worse. And there are some horrible moments in this film. Some of the photography in this film is so cheap that, you know, when there's there was an entire, like, five-minute sequence between good cop and girl cop in the car talking to each other, and it's all close-up. The entire screen is filled with side shots of their heads. Like, you can't see the rest of the car. You can't see any of the background... And then I'm just like, and the sequence just kept going back, forth, back, forth, back and forth. And I was like, I don't even care what they're talking about anymore. I, this is just horrible to look at. This is horrible. And there are many sequences like that where it's just all close-ups. The transitions in the film also really annoyed me, as I said earlier. But what I did like was the one sequence with the auditor and Sean Carter being interrogated. We got a little bit of lore about the Hellraiser world. And, you know, I liked the auditor as, like, since the first Hellraiser film, there's been another Cenobite that's interesting. You know, considering the Chatterer turns up, and even the Chatterer mechanic of his mouth doesn't work it properly. Was just, it was just a headshot, wasn't it? It was, well, I mean... It, we didn't even see the whole body of the Chatterer. Oh, you saw sort of, like, chest and head. Oh. And, uh, Cosplay uh, outfit. I also kind of liked the, the small design change they made for, for Pinhead's outfit, where... They decided to... Well, the idea behind it was that it was the Leviathan thing oh, shape yeah. in his chest piece. I was like, that's a nice little design change. Yeah, but didn't they also have the nod to the eye of Agamotto with Doc, fucking Doctor Strange in it as well? Yeah, well, considering Scott Derrickson was one of the directors for a previous Hellraiser film who went on to do Doctor Strange. Wow, he got out quick. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, that was my only one real favourite sequence. You know, I enjoyed aspects of the first ten minutes... Because it was a, it was a, I don't know, I guess it was a better opening than the, the previous six films. <laughs> yeah, the previous six, nice. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's not many favourite scenes. But do I recommend Hellraiser Judgment? Uh, no. And yes. Now, the thing is, I recommend it to those people who are stupid horror fans like everybody else that will just keep watching the sequels because it's too late. You've probably already seen it or you plan to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you, for, the, for the love of Hellraiser, you probably will watch it. Or unless you reach the point where you're just like, I'm Clive Barker enthusiast. I'm going to go and read the Gospels and other stuff that's attached to Hellraiser, not done by Miramax. Yeah. Would you watch this as a as just a horror film? You know, if you're not even aware of the Hellraiser films, would you just watch this one? No. no. Not, not, not really. You know, if you are an aspiring filmmaker and want to see what could be done with a micro budget, it's definitely a curiosity thing to go, let's see where that money was spent. 
And obviously, with them not paying for Doug, a lot of it went on the special effects, and they're all practical effects. And so I kind of, I always like that, that at least they tried and did something practical. Probably won't ever see many of these actors ever again. No, probably in the next Hellraiser movie. A lot of people have at least credited the actor playing the new pinhead, Paul T. Taylor, and said that, you know, if anyone could have filled Doug Bradley's shoes, at least he did it. You know, he's nowhere near in the same league, and even the director knew that. He was like, there's no one can replace Doug. No one on the planet Mm. can do Pinhead. But if we have to, if we have to do it, someone's got to do it. And so this person did an okay job. And from what I've gathered from the internet, it's kind of split where people are just like, done. If it's, you know, no Doug, no Pinhead. Yeah, no. And like, you're right. It's It's, not Pinhead. It's it's like doing a Chucky movie without Brad Dorff. It's like doing a Nightmare on Elm Street movie without uh, Robert, Robert England, yeah. you know? It's just, you, we just immediately go, no, it's no. not, don't bother. Just don't. But if you have to, <laughs> you have to. You fucking have to. I'd recommend Hellraiser if you're curious, if you're a sadomasochist, you know, and you just want to keep suffering through the sequels, mm. go right ahead, open that box. <laughs> I do, and I don't recommend Hellraiser Judgment, and I'm going to start with the the latter first. I don't recommend Hellraiser Judgment um, because it's badly filmed, badly edited, badly lit, badly wrote, bad special effects, bad acting, uh, badly put together. I mean, the film company behind it is obviously run by a fucking... Well, I don't know if it's run by the dickhead or if it's done by the dickhead's brother, but, you know... The it's wa- Bob Weinstein the, now. The, the, the Weinsteins are in there somewhere. No, only the one. He's, the other one is out. He's gone. Yeah. Now. Now he is. At the time of this fucking filmmaking, he was partially still... The, I'm not going into that part. What I'm saying is this film was such a fucking rush job. It's like watching a college fucking, you know, art piece. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, it it's, is. it's like somebody came along to these actors and said, oh, are you just finishing film school? Right, tell you what, you can get a good grade if you make this movie. And so they did. Like Gary said, on a micro budget, you can see what they do. But in the in the world that we live in nowadays, where so much is expected from films, you cannot fuck up. You know, if your audio is not good, you fucked up. If your script isn't good, you fucked up. If your fucking actors aren't giving off a fucking Oscar winning fucking description about who their fucking character is, you fucked up. If you couldn't get the main fucking character actor back to play your main fucking character, you fucked up. If you keep having put into if you keep having to kill shit off of screen, you fucked up. It doesn't matter how over intense you make the first 10 minutes. Okay, you can make the fucking audience vomit within the first five minutes of the movie. And if the rest of the fucking hour and 25 minutes that they have to sit through is a boring fucking sit in a Sunday church, you've fucked up. But I also do recommend it because I want to put this film out there for all those people who turn to me every now and again and say, Oh, Ian, I didn't like that film. It was shit. And have no backing for their argument. Okay? If you think a film is shit, go and watch Hellraiser fucking Judgment. Because then, and only then, will you know the true fucking meaning of shit. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Yeah, end us the lesson.